I'm John Banther, and this is Classical Breakdown. From Classical WETA in Washington, we take you behind the music. In this episode, Classical WETA host James Jacobs joins me as we go on a deep dive on Haydn's Symphony No. 104. With musical examples, we show you the anatomy of sonata form, influences of composers like Mozart and Bach, and just why this symphony is an iconic example from the classical period. So James, have you played Haydn's Symphony No. 104 before? Yes, I played it in when I was in high school. I played it in youth orchestra, and uh, it was uh, one of the pieces that we we basically just sort of sight read through it, and then we ended up doing it in the concert um, to replay something else that we were supposed to be doing. But I remember playing it, and somehow it was just very satisfying to play this piece that we could make sound decent, and also it was just very rewarding. The, the great thing about Haydn is that it, you you always find something new and you never really get sick of his music. It's just, there's always something new to explore. Yeah. It sounds like it would be not just, um, technically approachable, but musically approachable too, for musicians, uh, you and youth orchestra to, you know, the professional symphony. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's Haydn is so satisfying that way. And, um, and that was by design. Uh, he was so used to, you know, in his career, his 29 years working for um, as Kapellmeister for Prince Nicholas of Esterhazy, he basically had an audience of one. And as he put it, he was forced to be original because that audience of one could would know when he was repeating himself or phoning it in. And so Haydn and Haydn was had to keep on doing it, and it paid off because even though he was sequestered in this little corner of, of Eastern Austria, he gained uh, an international reputation. What I love about this symphony is that it feels like it is kind of like the rubber stamp of the symphony in the classical period, in the classical form, like the perfect kind of package to then hand off to, you know, Beethoven, who wrote his first symphony a few years later. It's like um, all the things I would want and a symphony in this time period in the 1700s is all brought to fruition here just a, a few years before 1800. So Franz Josef Haydn, born in 1732, died in 1809. You've already mentioned uh, a big part of his career was at the Esterhazy estate. He was writing and performing music for the royal court, this audience of one who had to be um, satisfied. And he wrote a lot of symphonies to be performed there too. But when the prince died in 1790, the son took over and he wasn't so much into uh, this music thing. So he said to Haydn, okay, you know, go ahead, take your pension. Um, he still paid them a, a little bit of money also um, as he was doing just a few things when he was in town. Yeah, uh, Haydn, well, Haydn not only got a, a a pension, uh, basically sort of a retainer fee uh, from yeah. Prince Anton. But he also, uh, before he died, um, Prince Nicholas left him uh, a pension of a thousand florins a month. So Haydn was fine. Yeah. Uh, he was, but he, but you know, he was. It is. He was 58. He was probably looking forward to retire. Apparently, he went to Vienna so fast, he left a lot of his personal belongings behind at the really? at the palace. He just wanted to get out of there. Yeah. And um. And while he was there, uh, Solomon, uh, this guy from uh, England, a violinist from England, heard about this. This was news. That he oh, had retired. Yeah, he had retired. And Solomon, you know, went to v Vienna specifically to say, hey, I've got, you know, basically making Haydn an offer he couldn't refuse to say, come to London and and write symphonies for his orchestra. Yeah. And he was like a rock star. I mean, people, <sighs> people yeah. screaming getting all the way to the front of the stage to see him. I mean, it was like Beatles oh, in the 1790s. Yeah. yeah, and can you imagine the guy, you know, just turning 60 and then, you know, being basically this servant and then all of a sudden being the toast of, of London of all places, you know, which is, that was the world capital at that time. That was, you know, that was amazing. So he really, and he was well paid and, uh, and so he kept on turning you know, he had already written 90, you know, 92 symphonies. And then, you know, he was writing a dozen more in the space of four years or so. Yeah, four years. And he's wrote these final 12 symphonies, which we know as the London symphonies. And this last one, number 104, is known as the London symphony. 
And we're going to listen to it, of course, examples throughout this episode with the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra and conductor Sir Colin Davis. But what's so interesting is is that when he wrote this and premiered it in 1795 in, uh, in May, I think, he lived for another 14 years. And this wasn't billed as his final symphony. It just ended up as his final one. And I think it's a perfect send off. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he had, he just ended up doing other things. He wrote two major oratorios. He wrote a series of, of masses. And I, I think there's also something about these London symphonies that are sort of a tribute to Mozart, uh, who had died just as Haydn, you know, and Haydn was trying to get Mozart to come to London too. And then he was, and he only found out about Mozart's death when he had been in London for about a month. And then, oh, okay. And then he sort of, so in a way it was sort of a tribute to like trying to carry on Mozart's legacy as well in the symphony, I think. Right. You know, as Mozart ex- died in uh, 1791, I mean, he had just gotten there. Yeah, exactly. London. For example, uh, Haydn had never used clarinets before, <laughs> before these last, you know, before age 60. Yeah. You know, it was Mozart using them a lot. And, then, you know, and so he was, he was actually uh, influenced by Mozart in, in doing some new things and experimenting. You know, he was still in the habit of trying to you know, make sure nobody was bored and and that worked, that paid off for him in London. You're right. Nobody was bored. It paid off. Um, you, you will find clarinets in this symphony along with strings, um, flutes, oboes, bassoons, horns, trumpets, and uh, timpani as well. Now, when he premiered this, he made a lot of money. He wrote in his diary, the whole company was thoroughly pleased and so was I. I made 4,000 golden in this evening. Such a thing is possible only in England. And I tr- I've been trying to figure out well, how much buying power is that today or whatever. And I think that the the gold on the floor, I think it was kind of interchangeable, I guess, and, and maybe it's power. So 4,000 that one night, that's four times his pension in one year in just that night. Yeah. Uh, Handel had discovered that a half century before that London was the place to, to make money and, and Handel made money. So and so did Haydn. Let's listen to the very beginning of this symphony. It's a very intriguing opening. We have these these kind of big statements and fanfares, and then I suddenly get this um, Mozart Requiem vibe. Oh yeah, in the strings. It's, it's very it's very mysterious. But also, I wanted everyone to pay attention to those first no- two notes: dum bum ba bum d a, because that is a microcosm of the entire journey of the entire symphony, as we'll see, not only in terms of the first movement going from D to A and then back again, but also the last two notes of the symphony are A, D. So this is it's sort of, this book ends in a very, very neat, satisfying way. And it's very elemental. It's so simple and so basic. And so uh, in terms of, you know, musical materials and, and, and yet it, the way Haydn states it, it's it's powerful. And you find that with also Mozart and Beethoven is that the older they get, it's this simpler material that they use to then expand upon. Maybe, you know, they with their wisdom, they understand this as opposed to, you know, maybe trying to be flashy or do all these extra things in the first moment. Um, that repeats in that kind of way um, a couple of times. You hear those notes you just mentioned and this kind of um, very, very light string um, in it as well. And then we get to kind of the next section of the symphony. Here's a little bit more of the introduction going into the next part. And the clouds are opening up, and we have this totally different thing happening now. Haydn was really the person who started the whole idea of the slow introduction uh, to a fast first movement. And you always get this sense that you're 
and, and he actually made this even more famous in his oratorio, The Creation, uh, which he wrote just a couple of years after this, where it begins with chaos that leads into cosmos, that leads into light. And he does that in a little way in, in so many of his symphonies where you sort of feel lost and confused. And, and it's very great. It's very satisfying when you come in from off the street and you and you kind of have to get your bearings to be in this. And then and Haydn takes you through it by the hand, like on a hike. He sort of takes you through the idea of, okay, you're a little confused and we're going to have this sort of gauzy music here. And then we're going to lead you to this nice straight path. And with that introduction, we get to what we can call sonata form. And this is something we've mentioned in several episodes before, but we didn't really go over. And part of that is because it can be very, very complicated. If you walk down a hallway and you see on a door and it says, inside is the definition of sonata form, you open the door, the room is on fire, you have musicologists screaming at each other, one's in the corner crying. Um, There is a lot of debate about the intricacies and small details that make up sonata form, but there's big sections that make up the form that we all can agree on, and that would be having the exposition, the development, and the recapitulation. And on the bookends of that, an introduction, which we just heard, in a coda at the very end of the um, of the movement, and these may be some foreign words, but we can really get into this and think about it very simply as going on a hike. So, first off, that introduction that is us. We we're arriving at the park, getting ready to go for our hike. We're not at the trailhead yet. We're getting an idea of the sound, um, the instruments that are being played, the atmosphere of this park. We have the the D and the A, as you mentioned, in this fanfare. And then where we just left off, that is the exposition. And this is where our hike officially starts. We're at the trailhead and we're walking. And what do you do when you go on a hike? Right when you start, you see all the different trees, the different uh, foliage and wildlife, just like we can hear the main themes and the main ideas being presented in the symphony. So here is the uh, a good chunk of the opening here of the exposition getting the idea of the main themes And it gets joyful and everything. Um, two things. One, we have the very obvious ba di da dum, and then we have bum 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 bum. These four quarter notes. And I think with those quarter notes right now, you can put them in your pocket. It's a little <laughs> melody you put in your pocket for a little snack later on. And we'll get to that. Yes, yes, yeah. This is you have to really pay attention because these things are going to come back. Um, it's it's like little clues in the detective novel. You sort of like, oh, that's going to come back. You you pay attention, and and just like on the on the hike, you know, you sort of like you see certain kinds of flora and fauna, and and you realize, oh, we're going to get more of this and uh, more of this kind of grass, more of this kind of tree and birds and things. Yeah. And, uh, and you don't, and it might not be exactly what you expect. No. <laughs> and so we heard the theme, and then it kind of go, goes into an exciting section. We're going to hear it again. And that's because, well, first off, after listening to this explanation of sonata form, I really think anyone can understand and recognize these big sections in symphonies all across the classical period into the Romantic period, too. So let's continue our hike here with Haydn, a little bit more of the sound and ideas in this exposition. It's just so much fun to play. I imagine if I was in high school playing this in youth orchestra, it would just be a lot of fun. It is a blast to play. It's always very satisfying. And uh, I was, you know, I was playing the cello part, and you've got the basses uh, doubling you at the, uh, you know, the octave. You know, so it's got it's really strong. You sort of feel like, oh, you know, you're really carrying the whole, um, you're like fundament of the fundament of all of it. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, it, it's it's a blast. It's a it's a it's a great teenage. I mean, it's interesting that Haydn wrote this. 
you know, when he was 63 because it, it felt like a perfect teenage piece. Yeah. So we hear the the theme played in different instruments in slightly different ways and, and passed around. And eventually we do get to the part where the exposition repeats. So it's not a trick this time. Let's take a listen. And I think you can identify where that main theme melody comes back in from the beginning. And we're back. And I also wanted to uh, remember when I talked about D A D, so that A D relationship that was that was uh, established at the very very beginning of the piece keeps on coming up, and and that's how. You know, we sort of like we seem to be on one level and then all of a sudden we're back at the D level. And that and it's and this is the way composers um, psychologically um, manipulate us into thinking we're home. We're away from home. Right. We're back home. Yes. And this is this is the journey that we take. And that whole journey repeats from the beginning. We get to enjoy all those ideas as they were presented originally. And then we get into the next section. So. We're going to pretend we just went through all of it again, and then we're going to start towards the end of this exposition to where something new comes in. And then all of a sudden, it's a little mysterious. Yeah, all of and, a sudden, there's drama. Yes, and one way to know you're, you're really done with the exposition, when the exposition ends... If it sounds like that's a point where if it stayed silent and you could clap, like it'd be the end of something, that's like the end of the exposition. And it goes into something mysterious here. We're now into the development of the sonata form. We've decided we're a little bored with the trail we're on on this hike. And now we're going to take a little bit of a detour, just start walking through the woods. Yeah, there's unknown factors here. Unknown factors. We get to... Uh, well, one, it's already in a, in a minor key now. I think we're in B minor. And then it goes through all these different keys, very, very distant. Um, the melody gets turned around. It gets transposed, really kind of chopped up and remade into a different dish. And what's interesting is the part of the melody that Haydn chose to develop might be what you would consider the least interesting part. You know, dee da da dum ba 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 you wouldn't think of the da 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 as as being right. the part, but that's the part that Haydn takes as his starting point, and he says, and he and he shows us there's a lot going on with the ba 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 ba, and that's that <laughs> that's that um, melody we had in our pocket. Right now we take it out of our pocket, and this is the snack we enjoy as we're going off into kind of scary territory. This yes. is when when you're listening to a symphony, especially I think um, Beethoven's second symphony, it gets very stormy, very, very kind of scary. Yes. But also, well, there's also a Beethoven's fifth element that I wanted to talk about. We'll, we'll yeah. get to that. But, but but first of all, let's hear the development with the, with the bop, 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 and what he does with that. So notice how he goes from ba 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 to ba 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 da ba 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 da short 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 long you know which was uh, that's actually uh, something again from classical Greek. There's something called the quart the quartus pan, uh, which is uh, again a sort of rhetorical device that was used in oratory that Beethoven used in his fifth symphony. You know da 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 dum, and that was yeah. used in World War Two as the V for Victory Morse code. Uh, you know, um, you know, d d d, and was and has even been used by you know when Martin Luther King said, "I have a dream." He was consciously, uh, uh, you know, conjuring that idea of ba 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 being this sort of statement of power of, yeah. and uh, which you weren't expecting in this neat, nice little hike. You were, right. <laughs> I know Morse code, so every time I hear the V da 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 da, I think um, Beethoven five. Yeah. Right. Um, but it, it is a little scary because now we're seeing different trees, different animals, yes. different things than we saw before. Um, so I think it really kind of fits in, in nicely. Now, this kind of goes around 
in this development, we're kind of, we don't know where we are now in this forest, but at one point we start to kind of circle back from the storm and get back to our original path. Every time you take a hike, there's always that moment in the hike when you feel like, you know, all of a sudden, okay, I'm out of the world now. Now I'm and I'm I'm really in the wilderness. I'm I'm really out there. Uh, for just a moment, you might not, you might be lost just for a microsecond. Like I don't know <laughs> if I'm gonna get back. Then there, and then then you see the blaze on the trees, and okay, you're you're yeah, you're fine again. But there's always that one little moment where oh my gosh, I'm I'm in the woods. I'm out I'm out here, and and Haydn I I, I think um, illustrates that so beautifully uh, in this in the journey through some sonata form that moment when. Oh, there's there's no net. <laughs> right. And so the end of this development section, as the exposition, the end of it was kind of like if the music stopped, we could clap. Here with the development, it's different. Most times it's suspenseful. It's not this perfect cadence, as we'll call it. It's um, imperfect. And you're left in suspense waiting for what's happening next. And then that's when you get that next thing, which we call recapitulation. We're now bringing back the original theme as it was before. It's been torn apart and remixed and, and everything. Now it's back to where it was. And it's you're on the trail again. And it's like if it's a loop, you're headed back home as you're more familiar with these themes and trees we already saw. Right. But of course, also, as recapitulations always tell us, um, you know, you're always going to be changed by your journey. Um, it's never quite. It's not. It's never identical. It's no. always. It's always. You know, because you're you're going home, and that's a different feeling than going out. It's and, and very different. Yeah. And that is the feeling that composers want you to uh, feel uh, with how they structure the recapitulation. That it's it's the same, but it's also different because it's leading you back and not just leading you out. And after the recapitulation, here in this symphony and in many others, but not always, we find a um, what we call a coda. And that's like, so say when you listen to the recapitulation, when it ends, again, if the music stopped right after that, it kind of be like the end of the movement. You could kind of clap. But it comes back in, and this is really wrapping up everything nice and neat. We've now finished our trail, and we're headed back to our, our car or, or whatever, and the journey is over. And now the hike is officially over. Exactly. That's the you, end of the very. That's the end of the first movement. You really get that feeling of of reflecting on what you've seen. Yeah. And uh, you know that extra little bit at the end that that you get in the coda is is really does sort of capture that sort of like okay, well, this is where we've been. This is where and we've ended up here. And uh, and there's also sort of the feeling that. It could still develop in so many different directions. It's like a river that keeps on going. With you know, it's... well, this has been quite a hike. Let's take a break. Classical breakdown is made possible by Classical W E T A. Join us for the music anytime, day or night. To listen live, just go to our website, classicalweta.org, or download our app. It's free in the App Store. So now our hike is over. This beautiful first movement, introduction, exposition. Uh, development, recapitulation, and coda. Now we get to the other movements, the second, third, and fourth. Uh, second and third, maybe not as substantial, but still there's a lot to enjoy, especially as we go now into the second movement, this Andante. So is this the dream that you have when you're taking your nap after the hike? <laughs> oh, maybe, yeah. <laughs> because well, it's got there's, there's some stuff going on, you know, that could be like that.
what I think Haydn does so good with second movements, and that is it's very pondering. I feel like I'm on a stroll, you know, through some estate or something. You know, you, when you walk with your hands behind your back, you're just leisurely walking. Right. It, it does feel, as opposed to the first movement, this does feel like it's a domestic scene, like we're at home somehow yeah. or around our home, and we're contemplating that. So it's more relaxed. Um, but it's also very alert somehow. Like your your senses senses are still height high, uh, heightened heightened <laughs> heightened. I like that. Yes, exactly. And uh, this is andante, right? Yes. That, yeah, which literally means walking. Right. And you can it, it feels like a walking tempo. It feels like it's a walking around. It's deceptively simple and deceptively pondering. I like what you said when you said it's alert because then we get to this section kind of after this pondering part, which brings an intensity about it that you might not really expect for this nice little strolling on Dante. And to me, this right away all of a sudden sounds like Bach, as if, you know, those arrangements for a big orchestra of some smaller works of Bach, it sounds like I'm listening to something like that. Yeah, it's almost like he's summing up the entire 18th century, because it's funny, because what I was just thinking of, like, it sounds a little bit like Mozart's 40th, da 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 Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, which he might very well have been paying tribute to, since Mozart had just written that uh, about eight years before, and... You know, and Haydn definitely knew that work. Um, but I also, but it's also, I think, you know, very, and this is what composers do to make, um, how do you make four movements sound like they belong to the same symphony? And I think one of the ways that Haydn does that is sort of, it's the same sort of journey where you have this very simple melody that all of a sudden he brings shadows and life to and storminess to um, after a while. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's kind of, there's a theme going on that there's um, that there's a lot going on under underneath the surface that gets revealed half, about halfway through the movement in each case. And after this kind of tumultuous section, it does bring it back as you as you've mentioned. But he brings the whole thing back. Well, you don't want to re- just repeat yourself, of course. So he brings it back in a way and adds a different rhythm that we've heard so far. <laughs> triplets three notes instead of um maybe two not da 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 one two three one two three yeah haydn was sort of writing out what musicians normally did when they played chamber music which was to add ornamentation and um of course he knew that a whole orchestra couldn't ornament in unison so he he did it for them yeah and uh and these ornaments are like little little figures that wouldn't be written into the music most of the time but it was kind of an understood practice of adding something in. Yes. But you guys just said you can't do that. The whole orchestra is going to be playing their own little things. Right. You have to write it in. So in a way, this actually tells us what ornamentation was really like, you know, in terms of what they might have done in a piece of chamber music. And uh, it's uh, and it's also just, you know, another example of the constant theme of Haydn throughout his life, like don't repeat yourself. You know, the prince can't get bored. You know, yeah. <laughs> you have to you have to show him something new. We have to show him a different different idea, and uh, and and he he's constantly doing that. Before we leave this movement, I want to play another section that just stands out to me that I just really like, and I've in my head I call it bassoon glue. I'm so glad you're gonna. Re- I was I had that was the other thing. Note the use of bassoon. That was on my notes. Well, I wonder <laughs> if you're talking about the same part because you have this. It's going from one kind of section to another, from strings and then winds. But before the, and it's not like the strings play, stop, winds come in. The bassoon is overlapping both of them. And the dynamic, you hear the dynamics so subtly changed. I love it. I, I feel like 
throughout this symphony, but particularly in this movement, the bassoon is a character that's sort of commenting on the action that's sort of, I mean, there are whole sections where it's just the strings and then the bassoon comes in and doubles things for no real reason except that, oh, there's this kind of interesting creature, this interesting character, the bassoon, that's sort of coming in and joining. And it is weird that jumping back to that exposition, which we all now know, in the first measure, the first couple of notes, the strings play, and the bassoon plays with them too. The only wind instrument's kind of like, okay. Um, yeah, that that was not common. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was a Haydn thing. And uh, I mean, well, Mozart did it too. And maybe that was a tribute to the way Mozart used the bassoon. But but still, it's but there's also something very unique to the symphony about about the character the bassoon takes on as a sort of, uh, as some... I mean, because a bassoon is definitely not a string instrument. It doesn't really blend in. You know, it's a, like a clarinet could, you know, in certain ways. You know, a horn could. But a bassoon has a more gonna... hollow texture. Yeah. It doesn't stick out, but it adds a different color, a different twist when it's just with strings. You know, when I uh, – thinking about that uh, that first movement, the hike, I th- you know, bassoon is sort of like – what a tree would sound like if a tree if a tree yeah. could had a voice. It's it's big and woody. Yeah, and then we get into what was still very traditional at the time, which Beethoven would break, but that is having this beautiful third movement minuet. <laughs> Already a couple of things here. One, we've got, it's his minuet, but it's hiding. So he does something a little bit different. He adds this, this trill, the notes going back and forth really fast. And it's kind of, I've read it's like laughter. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, he, he laughs. And also something that you might not have noticed, but you know, you can go back and listen to it again, that uh, he he says the same you know, short melody twice. And normally what the composer would do is simply put a repeat mark. But what he does is he actually does something different already. He 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 reorchestrates the same melody twice from the get go. And so he, he what we would call write out writes out the repeat yeah. that we would normally expect. And so he's all he's he's still in his very final symphony, like can't you know, gotta gotta make it new, gotta make it new. And towards the end is he he starts doing something that he does throughout the the um, minuet that makes it a little bit different is that it's not just one two three one two three but it starts adding in one two three one two three one so he's kind of putting this the emphasis it's kind of like off kilter. Right. This is not. You know, this this is something that uh, is sometimes misunderstood. Like, oh, minuet is a dance. Well, these are not dance this is not dance music it's it's music inspired by dance right um if you actually tried to dance to it then you might trip over somebody because he keeps on uh sort of pulling the rug out by by shifting the beat in a way it's music to listen to that you makes you sort of dance in your mind as it, as it evokes that the the theme it's it's certainly a lighter piece and this is the way that it's traditionally been used in a way it's the most constrictive movement because it's such a strict form that the composer has to uh, adhere to and there's less expected of it in terms of musical weight but uh, that just means the composer has you know takes up the challenge and can do that much more with it so much can be done when there's an artist who's kind of painted into a box and they have a very strict set of rules of course they can break the rules but sometimes creating something totally different with the rules is, is really impressive now we've Already mentioned, it's like we hear a bunch of different composers in here. We've heard um, like Bach and Mozart. And I think we start to hear other composers after Haydn. And it's kind of like unfair, as we'll kind of get to in a second, um, because, of course, maybe those composers, they sounded like Haydn. Here's a little bit more of this uh, minuet. Thank you. 
I swear. There's the bassoon again. There's the bassoon. <laughs> yeah. But I swear, there is something so Tchaikovsky Ballet Swan Lake about oh, this. Oh, yes. I played Absolutely. it a million times. I hear this and I'm thinking, where where in the ballet is this? It, it's, it sounds like it's really from Tchaikovsky. Oh, yeah. It really does sound like Tchaikovsky. And it's just, and also just that uh, sort of ambiguous da 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 da. I mean, it sounds so dreamy and you really do see. You know, tutus in a way. It's it's yeah. it's, uh, it's it's it it is very different, and it's um you know it it does feel like it's very forward looking, and you can hear all the composers who you know knew every moment. I mean, Tchaikovsky definitely knew the symphony. There was no question that Tchaikovsky, yes. you know, Tchaikovsky knew the symphony. Beethoven knew the symphony. Um, you know, Schubert knew the symphony. You can hear you know Schumann knew the symphony. You can and you can hear um, all of them. They're sort of pre pre echoes of all that music in, in this. And the way he kind of brings in the end here is, you know, very Haydn esque. It's not like a, a gimmicky, you know, dad joke or something. But he adds the the trill, like it's kind of laughter in, and then you're kind of held in suspense. Because Haydn in another symphony before has written where it sounds 100% like the end, and then there's like four measures of rest. Maybe they just hold out for like 10 seconds. And people who don't know, they start applauding, but then the orchestra comes back in a, like a half step higher. And it's, you know, it's, it's a total kind of you know, cruel joke. Right. But that's, I mean, I think we don't think about this when we hear, think of symphonies as this you know, thing that you listen to for 20 to 30 minutes you know, on a record. Um, there were performance pieces. He definitely, there was aspects in many of his symphonies, including this one, where you, the experience is heightened by a live performance. And, um, and he plays on expectations and he plays with the audience. Just now, that thing of that delayed trill. I mean, the audience could have gone wild after that. Um, yeah. And they probably did. They didn't care if they cl- clapped between movements. You oh, know, they, they were definitely <laughs> clapping and screaming between movements for the these Haydn premieres. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And uh, they they were they would go wild. And and he knew he, he knew how to get an audience's attention. And uh, and again, that's something that's a little hard for us to appreciate because we you know use. Haydn as background music and blah blah blah, but uh, back then there was a lot less ambient noise, and so they were wrapped. They were they were so involved with every note, uh, every step of the journey that Haydn was taking them on, and uh, and it rewards that when when you get when you take this deep dive. And I've read that they were very very enthusiastic after just the opening of the fourth movement. There's already so many things happening. One, we've got this drone. It all of a sudden sounds very folk song like. You've mentioned before, like a musette, a kind of um, bagpipe or accordion type instrument that would serve this boom, this yeah. kind of drone yes. role. So, I mean, you immediately know that there's going to be like a folk song. But then he takes the rhythm from the opening theme that we heard in the first movement and flips it around. Dee da dum, be da dum. Instead of ba dee da dum, that kind of thing. And now the emphasis is on beat two. If we're thinking da da bum, be da bum, it gives that very folk kind of dance. Haydn vibe. was, I think, even though he was writing this for London, I think he was also paying tribute to where he spent most of his life, which was in uh, Eisenstadt, which is where the Esterhazy uh, Palace was, which is in extreme East Austria on the on the border of both. Uh, near the borders of both Hungary and Croatia, and uh, and we can hear the rhythms in this in this tune, the rhythms of of the folk music, particularly of Croatia. Um, in fact, Bartok claimed that he knew the source of this exact tune. You know, the origins of folk music is you can is one of those another one of those things you can debate all all day. But yeah. but uh, definitely it, there's there's that feeling and the idea of that. That bagpipe, it's all. Yeah, it's also very heavy metalish. You know. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think that um that Croatian folk song you're mentioning, Oi Yelo Yelo Yela, and actually on the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org we'll have that um 
I'll have a video of that folk song, and it's just uh, it's so much fun. Um, but that, I mean, that really set people off. They got so excited to hear this, you know, sudden folk song melody coming in or this this style out of not out of nowhere, but still not totally expected. Oh, it's not totally expected, even for Haydn. And yeah, you know, this was the twelfth symphony that they had heard of Haydn. Um, in the space of four years. And even for Haydn, this was something new. Even, you know, the idea that you could put in this element, this really raw, unpolished element of folk music in in a symphony. Um, That was something, you know, people talk about Mahler's first symphony because that was so bold in doing that. But actually, here's Haydn doing it a whole full century before. Yeah. (laughs) And this movement is also in sonata form. We'll get a little glimpse of that later on, but we're not going to go through the whole hike again. We're, we're tired from that. But when you listen to it, and in other symphonies too, you'll find the same thing with the finale being in sonata form. When you listen to it, I think you, you're we're all more equipped to kind of identify these these sections and everything. Now, speaking of composers where it's like, oh, this reminds me of Mozart or uh, Bach or Tchaikovsky in the future, here it sounds like another composer picked up right where he left off with this. If you play just the first five seconds, ten seconds, I'm like, oh, James, what Beethoven are you listening yeah, to? Yeah, I know. I was just thinking that's exactly the second symphony, or that's exactly, you know, the seventh symphony. Oh, actually, that that part right there is the seventh symphony that we just that yeah. I was just talking over. That like he does some. There's a part that's exactly in the the finale of the seventh symphony. He does uh, Beethoven does almost something almost exactly the same thing. It sounds like I mean, what you say. I mean, it's Beethoven sounding like Haydn in that time, of course. Right. But I mean, he that's it's like this is why I love this symphony that it's like it's the final rubber stamp of seal of approval classical symphony that Beethoven takes and then runs with. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, Beethoven actually studied with Haydn and apparently Beethoven was a terrible pupil. And oh, really? um, yeah, Beethoven and Haydn did not get along, though, of course. I mean, Beethoven understood what he owed Haydn. I mean, yes. Beethoven did not. Him and Mozart, I mean, Beethoven was really modeling, especially his first and second. Right, exactly. And uh, but uh, there is uh, and there is even a sense of competition between uh, as as Beethoven was starting to get uh, successful around the turn of the century, uh, just a few years after this. And um, uh, between this young upstart Beethoven and and Haydn, but uh, but there was no question that Haydn was the master, you know. And Papa Haydn, Papa Haydn, as they call them. And uh, and and I think and I think there is something about this symphony that that that, as you say, it just kind of like, yep, this is this is what a symphony can do. This is it. This is you know, I've taught all you young grasshoppers well. This is <laughs> this is what this is this is what you can do with a symphony. And in, in speaking of journeys, when you go through the Haydn symphonies uh, and you keep on finding new new uh, new discoveries and new things that again were picked up by later composers, but he probably wasn't conscious of it being his last symphony. But, no, but uh, but it's it is interesting at the same time that he lived for fourteen more years and didn't write another one, and that might have had some. And even though you know, basically he wrote to the commission, but still I get the feeling that maybe the reason he didn't do that is because they're like, okay, I said it. I, I said what I had to say That's in this it. symphony. That's what I like. I don't I don't want to live in the alternate universe of where there's overlapping symphonies of Beethoven and Haydn. I want them separate. You know, Beethoven, you know, his first symphony a few years later. But That's an interesting point. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Otherwise, let's start arguing about if you wrote oh, two no, more I'm, symphonies. No, I'm not. Ar- I'm not arguing with you. Uh, I, that's I, I, I. You just that you absolutely that didn't occur to me. But you're absolutely right that uh, I think you know had Haydn kept on writing, then he would have. Then there would have been a clash. Yeah. You know, so Haydn went off and did something else that Beethoven wasn't doing, and. Um, yeah, and you're right. By the time Beethoven was writing his first two symphonies uh, five years later, uh, there was there was kind of no room really for the two of them. You know, there was. No, a... I, I would have seen a, you know, a Jay Leno Conan O'Brien situation <laughs> going on. Or yeah, uh, I think you're right about that. Yeah. So that's yeah, and uh, in a way, 
so after this, you know, Haydn was in a way almost competing with, you know, he started competing with Handel, you know, by, by, by saying, oh, I can write oratorios too, and I can write masses. And, and, uh, and he also had some more string quartets to write. But, uh, but, uh, but, I, but in a way, you're right, you can feel in this symphony sort of like, okay, here you go, Ludwig, yeah. your turn now. Uh, we have a couple more things to listen to from this. Uh, again, it's in sonata form. So I will play just the part where it kind of goes back and repeats so we can hear and you know know for sure about this idea. Very seamless. So thrilling. And with this one... There is actually, I don't think there is a repeat sign. It's written out right. because you have that extra biome uh, getting into the drone. It's exciting. The fourth movement, it's driving. It's like you listen to one phrase, you know where you're going. You know it's all leading up to this final point. And even in the development section that comes afterwards where it's kind of tumultuous, you know you're, you're not just wandering or marching in place. And this is something definitely Beethoven took and improved on. Beethoven yes. improved on making these developments really stormy and really kind of um, in your face. Well, what's interesting about the passage we just heard is that it reminded me a lot of middle period Haydn, like the kind of stuff that he was writing 30 years before during what we call the Sturm und Drang period, Storm and Stress. Uh, the origin of which, by the way, was a German play about the American Revolution. All right. <laughs> so it's actually... We have a little p- part to play in this. Um, and that's that's pretty rare in you know, the history of classical music, the United States having a have, some kind of an influence. Yeah, and uh, apparently we did because that was the whole idea of, of uh, this sort of storminess. But um, a lot of that time when you hear the Sherman Drang, the reason why that, that phrase is sometimes now used to think of like teen angst or unnecessary drama is because it just seemed like, oh, a lot of minor key you know, busyness for no apparent reason that doesn't, you know, doesn't seem to be leading anywhere. And you still feel a little vestige of that in that passage that we just heard, sort of like, well, this is the Sturman Drang mode. Yeah. And it took Beethoven to kind of say, no, actually, let's raise the stakes and actually make it be about something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, we can't go all this way and not hear the very, very end. And remember what I said, the very beginning was D, 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 A, and then the very end, A, D. It's it's a bookend. A exactly. Perfect, bringing the whole journey full circle. It's like the the perfect meal, you know, just, just perfectly satisfied, not too stuffed or anything. It's got all the flavors, everything I could have wanted. That's why I love this symphony and why it really stands out to me as one of the top of, of Franz Josef Haydn. Oh, absolutely! It's 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 satisfying, and it it doesn't, and it it feels like a fully, I don't want to, I don't want to say mature, but fully developed statement, uh, in the symphonic realm that can hold its own with anything from the nineteenth or twentieth centuries or twenty first centuries. It's yeah. you know, and uh, we don't have to sort of make excuses like, oh, well, it's just an early symphony. You're like, no, this is a master. <laughs> You know, uh, with a masterful symphony and uh, and a and a profound journey that he's taking us on, and uh, and also showing the possibilities for what a symphonic journey could be. And you know, in in the nineteenth century, the idea of the symphony became sort of the musical equivalent of the novel, the idea that it, which and novels have their own structure, and there's a symphonic structure that. Uh, the idea that you could put a world and a particular uh, inside this, and it's and it's so fascinating because you know when Haydn started off writing symphonies, 
you know, 30 years before, they were basically just uh, offshoots of opera overtures, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and the fact, you know, he, he managed to uh, create the idea of the symphony as being one of, in a way, one of the lightest and least important musical forms, you know, basically just like the thing that you play before you play the real thing in, uh, you know, the main event into the main event. Yeah. <laughs> well, we owe so much to Haydn. Well, that's it for me for Haydn's 104th. I don't know if you have anything else. Go out and listen to it. Uh, I think every time you hear it, you're going to hear something different. It's just like taking your favorite hike. And there, I'll put on the show notes page too, there is a recording, the Austro-Hungarian Haydn Orchestra, Adam Fischer conducting. It's an orchestra playing in the same concert hall at the Esterhazy Palace where Haydn worked and performed for so much of his career. All right. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown. For more information on things we talked about in this episode, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. And if you have any comments or ideas for episodes, you can send me an email at classicalbreakdown at weta.org. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from Classical WETA.